Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Well, we run two business courses here, the BA and the MBA. Which course were you interested in? First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Hi. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to enrol in your business course. Well, we run two business courses here, the BA and the MBA. Which course were you interested in? I don't have a degree, so I won't be able to study the MBA. That's right. OK, if you'd like to give me some details, I'll complete an application form and someone from the business department will contact you directly. First, what's your name? Jane Kinsella. Kinsella. Could you spell that for me? Hmm, it's K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. OK, and how old are you, Jane? Well, my date of birth is the 4th of August, 1982. Good, thanks. Can you tell me where you're from? I'm from Britain. And where do you live now? Number 32 Mach Road, Auckland. Can you spell your road name for me? Yes, it's M-A-I-C-H. Right, thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Thank you. Do you have a contact number? Only a mobile. It's 021 455 7326. And what are you doing now? Well, I was working in a shop until two weeks ago, but at the moment I'm not doing anything. Good. Now if we can move on to your education. Do you have any qualifications? As I said, I don't have a degree, but I do have four A levels. I'll write that down. So your ideal choice is to study the BA in Business Studies, is that right? Yes, that's right. If I can't enrol in that course, I'll wait until the next intake. OK, so no second choice of study. Tell me, why do you want to study the BA in Business? Well, I'm very interested in becoming self-employed at some time in the future, but I need some experience in a larger company first, and they won't accept people without a BA. Hmm. And how will you pay for the course? I'll use my savings for most of the course, and if I have any problems, I'll take a part-time job. But I hope I won't have to. That's fine. I'll just write savings. And now a final question. Do you mind if I ask you why you want to study here? Not at all. Your course was actually recommended by a friend. He's in his second year now, but he thinks it's very good. OK, that's great. I'll hand your application to the admissions office, and they'll contact you from there. Thanks very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student called Sarah talking to her college tutor about some research she has to do as part of her course. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Sarah. Hi. So, you want to talk about your research project? That's right. I want to find out how many people use the Tourist Information Office and what they think of the service they get. Interesting. Have you written your proposal yet? No, that's what I wanted to ask you about. What should I include? Someone said I should make a list of my aims first. Well, I don't know about a list. A statement of aims is the correct term. It's just a quick summary of what you hope to get out of the project. OK. And should I include other documents I've prepared? Like the questionnaire? I I'm still working on that. I can check that later. But I think it's good to prepare an information sheet for participants. It would help you to think about interview methods. It'd be good to see that soon. Oh, right. And I want the project to have statistical data, not just to be a collection of opinions. That's good. So that should be clear from the proposal too. Great. So what else must I include in the proposal? Or are some things optional? OK. Some things that people normally put in a research proposal don't really apply to you, like any costs involved. That can be really important in some research projects, but as we don't have a budget, it's not something you need to include. Any costs have to come out of your own pocket, I'm afraid. Yes, I understand that. But I do need to know your criteria for choosing who to interview. I've got to check that you're using good sampling principles, for example. Sure. And what about the way I'm going to analyse my findings? That's not essential at the proposal stage on this project, but if you've got some ideas, include them, because it could save time later. OK. And do I need to make it clear how the report will be organised? Oh, I'm going to be giving you a template to use, so there's no need to go into that in the proposal. Great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Actually, Another thing we could discuss now is making sound recordings of interviews. Oh, right. Do I have to record them all? I could try to get as many as possible, but it'd be rather expensive. Yes, don't worry. You only need a few chosen randomly just to give an idea of how the interviews are going. You can send one in each time you update me on your progress. OK. How often should I do that? I haven't done a timetable for the interviews yet, but they'll be spread over three or four weeks, with about 200 in total. I reckon on doing 20 a day. Hmm. Let me know how you're getting on at the end of each day's interviewing, then, whether you've had any problems or not. It can be a lonely job. Thanks. I appreciate that. And what about the confidentiality of participants? Because that can cause problems. Well, I'm getting them to sign a consent form. It says that I'll only use the information for my research, that I won't pass it on to anyone else. But that's the only promise I'm making. They have to give me their names and agree to their data being stored on the college computer network. That sounds good. You won't put names in your report, I know, and the data will all get deleted at the end of the year. But we don't promise any of that. Sure. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 3. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. Firstly, it is clear that tiredness is on the rise. No official data exists on the rate of people reporting to doctors with recurring tiredness, but it's a very common complaint. Research suggests that people are not relaxing properly and often work when they do not have enough energy. Furthermore, products to boost energy are also on the rise. Sales of so-called energy drinks loaded with caffeine and sugar have grown by 23% over the last year. And this is not the only instance of an increase in products claiming to boost energy. Guarana, a herbal stimulant, can now be found in everything from chocolate bars to tea bags. Now let's examine what it is that's making people so tired. Dr Liebhold, a Sydney GP, has done extensive research into this and he believes that financial pressures, not taking holidays and not having time off when you become ill due to fear of losing your job are all common causes. Some of the other suggested causes are low oxygen levels in offices, poor diet or illness. The problem is that tiredness is a symptom of just about every kind of illness, which makes tracking down the cause all the more difficult. The next question to ask is, are people getting enough sleep? Dr Mansfield from Melbourne's Epworth Sleep Centre, who specialises in sleep disorders, says insomnia often arises when people are going through a stressful period. Mansfield often needs to re-educate people in how to get off to sleep. He recommends keeping your body clock regular by going to bed and rising at similar times every day and not drinking too much caffeine. And there is some truth in the old story about having a glass of hot milk before bed. Milk contains the amino acid tryptophan, which has been shown to help induce sleepiness. Turning to the question of why we need sleep, researchers are still trying to answer this fundamental question. Sleep deprivation experiments have shown that after 14 days without sleep, rats will lie down and die. And after only three days sleep loss, humans get confused, forgetful and start having hallucinations. So whatever sleep does, it is important. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. However, not all researchers feel the same way. Trent Watson of the Dietitians Association is not convinced by McMahon's theory, explaining that our bodies don't really like to burn protein as a fuel, so it doesn't really contribute to energy levels. Carbohydrates, however, found in fruit, breads and pastas, are a more common fuel. Anyone following a rigidly high-protein diet with low carbohydrates, even if they are operating at low intensity during the day, could subject themselves to fatigue because they just don't have the carbohydrate stores, Watson says. In general, a good way to stay energised from a dietary point of view is to eat red meat, green leafy vegetables and whole grains. These foods give red blood cells the building blocks for optimum performance in their role of delivering oxygen to muscles. To sum up, 
tiredness is a health problem on the increase, and there continues to be much debate surrounding its causes and remedies. Now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Here a talk given by Don Parker, an expert on computer security, about the computer criminals. As you listen to the talk, fill in the gaps numbered 31 to 40. First, you will have some time to look at the notes below. Now listen to the talk. Hi there. As an expert on computer security, my job is to oversee and analyse the phenomenon in computer users. Computer has been commonplace in our daily life, make our life and work efficiently and lively. However, with the development of the computer technology, computer crime has come to arise more people's attention. Now, in respect of this topic, I will present some of my view and studies. What kinds of people are perpetrating most of the information technology crime? According to my research, over 80% may be employees. The rest are outside users, hackers and crackers and professional criminals. It is amazing that employees amount for this large portion. Let us see them in detail. Employees. Employees are those with the skills, the knowledge and the access to do bad things. Dishonest or disgruntled employees pose a far greater problem than most people have realised. To most supervisors and some experts, they worry that dishonest employees or outsiders can more easily intercept communications or steal company trade secrets. Workers may use information technology for personal profit or steal hardware or information to sell. They may also use it to seek revenge for real or imagined wrongs such as being passed over for promotion. Sometimes they may use the technology simply to demonstrate to themselves that they have the power over people. This may have been the case with a, a Georgia printing company employee convicted of sabotaging the firm's computer system. As files mysteriously disappeared and the system randomly crashed, other workers became so frustrated and enraged that they quit outside users. Suppliers and clients may also gain access to company's information technology and use it to commit crime. With both, this becomes more a possibility as electronic connections such as electronic data interchange systems become commonplace. Hackers and crackers. What are hackers? Hackers are people who gain unauthorized access to computer or telecommunication systems for the challenge or even the principle of it. Crackers also gain unauthorized access to information technology, but do so for malicious purposes. Crackers attempt to break into computers and deliberately obtain information for financial gain, to shut down hardware, pirate software, or destroy data. The tolerance for hackers as the benign explorer has decreased. Most communication systems administrators view any kind of unauthorized access as a threat, and they pursue the offenders vigorously. And educators also try to point out to students that university cannot provide an education for everybody if hacking continues. Professional criminals. Members of organized crime rings don't just steal information technology, they use it in a legal way as a business tool, but for illegal purposes. For instance, Databases can be used to keep track of illegal gambling debts and stolen goods. Drug dealers have used pages as link to customers. Microcomputers, scanners and printers can be used to forge checks, immigration papers, 
passports and driver's licenses. Telecommunications can be used to transfer funds illegally. As information technology crime has become more sophisticated, in 1988, after the last widespread internet break-in, the US Department created the Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT. Although it has no power to arrest or prosecute, CERT provides round-the-clock international information and security-related support services to users of the internet. Whenever it gets a report of an electronic snooper, whether on the internet or on a corporate email system, CERT stands ready to lend assistance. It counsels the party under attack, helps them thwart the intruder, and evaluates the system afterwards to protect against future break-ins. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.